M S W Media. Thanks to Athletic Greens for supporting the Daily Beans. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash dailybeans to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. News, Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, May 23rd, 2022. Today, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny, pressed Arizona lawmakers to send a fraudulent slate of electors. Lindsey Graham, Jay Sekulow, Sean Hannity, and CEO of Oracle Larry Ellison participated in a phone call about overturning the election back in November 2020. The Republican National Committee loses its bid to stop the January 6th committee from getting documents from one of its vendors. And Rudy sat with the committee for over nine hours on Friday. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hello, Dana. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you. And I would like to send my condolences to the committee for having to sit with Rudy Giuliani for nine hours. <laughs> we should send them like a get well soon card. Or something. We really should. Or they can just update their Facebook. And it's like, I survived the testimony. I mark myself safe over the testimony of Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, I, I had to talk to Rudy Giuliani for nine hours and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. That's right. I want to apologize to everyone for my voice today. I am sick. I'm sick today. She is sick today. I'm exhausted. So we're sick and tired, people. That's who we are today. We're not AG and DG. We are sick and tired. We are sick slash tired. And uh, it's not COVID. I've tested twice. Now two false or two negative, two false, two false tests, two negative rapid tests. So um, I don't think I, I don't think it's COVID, but it's something. So All I right. do apologize for my voice today. Later on in the show, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Tung Nguyen from the AAPI Victory Alliance. Dana, it's yes, such a great yes. conversation. Such an important conversation. I look forward to that. We have a lot of news to get to today. A lot of stuff happened over the weekend. I thought it was going to be restful. Oh, no. No. So uh, let's get to it. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. Ginny Thomas, the conservative activist and wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, pressed Arizona lawmakers after the 2020 election to set aside Biden's popular vote victory, throw away the votes of the people and choose a, quote, clean slate of electors, which is also known as fraudulent. OK, and that's according to emails obtained by The Washington Post, the email sent by Jenny Thomas to a pair of lawmakers on November 9th. This is two days after Joe Biden was declared the victor, argued that legislators needed to intervene because the vote had been marred by fraud. Though she did not mention either candidate by name, we know what she was talking about. <laughs> she wasn't talking about like the new CEO of golf and stuff, <laughs> right? It, it, she was talking about Biden and Trump. Uh, just days after media organizations called the race for Biden in Arizona nationwide, Thomas urged the lawmakers to, quote, stand strong in the face of political and media pressure and math, apparently. She told the lawmakers that the responsibility to choose electors was yours and yours alone and said they had, quote, the power to fight back against fraud, unquote. Thomas sent the messages via an online platform designed to make it easy to send pre-written form emails to multiple elected officials. That's according to a review of the emails obtained under the state's public records law. Arizona has a public records law. The messages show that Thomas, a staunch supporter of Donald Trump, was more deeply involved in the effort to overturn Biden's win than we previously thought. In sending the emails, Thomas played a role in the extraordinary scheme to keep Trump in office by substituting the will of legislatures for the will of voters. Unbelievable. Amazing. Amazing. Thomas's actions also underline concerns about potential conflicts of interest that her husband has faced. Do you think? Do you think? And may face in the future in deciding cases related to attempts to overturn 2020? Those questions intensified in March, as we know, when the Post and CBS News obtained text messages that Thomas sent to the old chief of staff, Mark Meadows, pressing him to help reverse the election. These emails were sent to Russell Rusty Bowers, a veteran legislator and speaker in the Arizona House, 
and Shauna Bolick, who was first elected to the chamber in 2018 and served on the House Elections Committee, the House Elections Committee during the 2020 session. Quote, Article 2 of the United States Constitution gives you an awesome responsibility to choose our state's electors. That's in the email from Jenny. Please take action to ensure a clean slate of electors is chosen. Clean. Ugh, that gives me the heebie-jeebies. Thomas's name also appears on an email to the two representatives on December 13th, the day before members of the Electoral College met to cast their votes. Remember, December 14th was one of the dates yes. where you we certify the electors from the states. Quote, before you choose your state's electors, consider what will happen to the nation we all love if you don't stand up and lead. That's Ginny Thomas. So, so the, the whole story is bananas. I mean, the fact that this even happened, but... Yeah. And and that email included a link to a video of a man delivering a message meant for swing state lawmakers, urging them to put things right and not give in to cowardice. Quote, you only have hours to act, said the speaker, who is not identified in the video, by the way. They, they made a video. I, I know this. There was a lot of planning on this. And, you know, it wasn't just like the first take. They, they cut. That's not how we're going to steal this election. We need you to sound a little more... Uh, and excited. All right, let me give it again. You only have hours to act. Okay, cut. <laughs> they made a motherfucking video yeah, and sent crazy. it to swing state electors. By December, the claim that legislators should override the popular vote in key states and appoint Trump, fraudulent Trump electors, was also being pushed publicly by John Eastman, a former law clerk to Clarence Thomas, by the way, and Rudy Giuliani. Trump's personal lawyer was also pushing this. By the way, there's a new whole new filing in the Eastman in the Eastman thing. And we're going to be going over that uh, Wednesday on cleanup on all 45. So, you know, got it. Thank you, A.G. And speaking of Rudy, the one time personal attorney and a lead architect of his attempt to overturn the 2020 election results met with the one six committee over nine hours for over nine hours on Friday. This is why we wanted to send our condolences. <laughs> Giuliani's original deposition with the committee had been postponed after the former New York city mayor asked to record the interview because he does like video with both audio and video. Okay. Now at the time, Giuliani's attorney, Robert Costello said the committee rejected that request. Now, despite Giuliani backing out of the original deposition, the two sides continued to negotiate an appearance which led to the Zoom appearance Friday. Now, Rudy's lawyer declined to comment, and a spokesperson for the select committee also declined to comment on Giuliani's deposition. A central figure in the former guy's failed bid to overturn the 2020 election, Giuliani was subpoenaed by the committee in January and had been engaging with lawmakers, through his lawyer, of course, about the scope of the subpoena and whether he may be able to comply with some requests. Now, in its subpoena, the committee alleges that Giuliani quote, actively promoted claims of election fraud on behalf of the former president and sought to convince state legislatures to take steps to overturn the election results. All of that is true. The subpoena also states that Giuliani was in contact with Trump and members of Congress, quote, regarding strategies for delaying or overturning the results of the 2020 election. Members of Congress. That's a big one. Now, several high-profile individuals from Donald's inner orbit have voluntarily spoke with the committee in recent weeks and months. In early May, Donald Trump Jr. met with the committee and Trump's daughter. <laughs> whenever whenever you mention tr Trump's orbit, I just picture him in his golfing outfit yeah. and like tiny pictures of these guys like literally orbiting around. That's him. probably what he pictures as well, by the way. <laughs> now, in early May, we had Jr. He met with the committee and, and Donald's daughter and former senior White House advisor, Ivanka Trump, she also met. They were interviewed for nearly eight hours last month, and her husband and former White House senior advisor, also uh, a scentless lotion, Jared Kushner, has met with the panel as well. Now, <laughs> Did you say a scentless lotion? Yeah, that's what I think Jared Kushner reminds me of, just scentless lotion. Oh my God, like from a hospital that just says lotion Yeah, that's it. it, just white, creamy, scentless. Huh. Yeah, huh. sorry, I said creamy. All right, John Dean, a key witness in the old Watergate investigation, mused on MSNBC that Rudy might have been given immunity in exchange for his testimony. Well, shit. I hope that's not true. <laughs> but what do you think about that, AG? Would you be okay with Rudy getting uh, immunity for testimony? I don't know. It depends on what he gives I up, guess right? That's true. He's, he's, he's under investigation for like 19 things. So giving him immunity on one. Okay, true. 
isn't going to be <laughs> isn't going to be. But I think it could be the case. Some kind of limited use immunity granted by the Department of Justice for his role in the coup. Maybe. I'll take it. But I actually think I don't know that he is necessarily given immunity. He's so guilty um, and he's a shit witness. Like, why would you want him? I'm actually leaning toward Rudy cooperating in exchange for maybe a lighter sentence. Maybe. With the Department of Justice in, in, in perhaps his case in the Eastern District of New York. Okay. With the Hunter Biden laptop op or in the coup. We don't know. We don't I, know. Want him, I want them to make him just publicly go, sorry, but the laptop, that whole thing, that wasn't real. Let's keep moving. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. And, you know, and the reason I think that is because several skinheads like Oath Keepers and Proud Boys have done the same thing have cooperated with the committee in hopes of getting a little leniency when they're very true. So we shall soon find out. All right. Next up, Dana, the court has denied a stay to the RNC, Republican National Committee, trying to block the one six committee from getting documents from their vendor Salesforce. Remember their I do. email vendor who yeah, sends out all those emails and Salesforce was like, we're happy to comply. We actually were super sorry if we had anything to do with the <laughs> violence on January 6th from the filing, which no one in the mainstream media is talking about, by the way, which blows my mind. And this I'm reading from the filing now. The court assumes that the RNC has shown that its appeal presents a serious legal question. And without doubt, the RNC has shown that it will suffer one sort of irreparable harm absent an injunction pending appeal, meaning you the the RNC, it'll suck for you if I don't give you this. Stay, yes. Right. But I'm not gonna. He's <laughs> it's so <laughs> great. It goes on to say, but it has not shown that the merged balance of equities and public interest factors, quote unquote, tip sharply in the RNC's favor. Nah, bro. Thus, the court will deny the RNC's motion insofar as it requests an injunction pending appeal. Even so, the court will grant the RNC's request for another brief administrative injunction so that it can seek an injunction pending appeal. We'll give you a, a temporary stay so that you can appeal our decision here today. In its motion, the RNC argues that there are five issues the court resolved against it, either on which it is likely to succeed on appeal or about which there is at least a serious legal question. So, we might not win, but this is this is a big deal, Judge, uh, is basically what they said. <laughs> and that satisfies the first Rule 62D criterion. The RNC points to its arguments that, one, the subpoena violates its First Amendment associational rights. No, it doesn't. Two, it was improper for the court to credit House defendants' narrowing of the subpoena. So even though we said it was too broad and they narrowed it, we don't think you should have listened to them when they narrowed it. So we're mad that it's broad. OK, makes sense. Number three, the select committee is not properly composed under its authorizing resolution because it contains only nine members. That's also been shown over and over again to be false. Number four, the subpoena violates the RNC's Fourth Amendment rights. Dana, it doesn't. And number five, the subpoena was not issued in service of a valid legislative purpose. Yes, it was. Given the court just resolved the case against the RNC, the court does not find that the RNC is likely to succeed on any of its claims. Whether the RNC's First Amendment claim presents a serious legal question, it's a close call, but the court assumes that the RNC has made such a showing. It's a serious legal issue. We got you. A serious legal question in this context is one that is so serious, substantial, difficult, and doubtful as to make it a, quote, fair ground for litigation and thus for more deliberate investigation. And then citation, citation, <laughs> citation that it presents an issue of first impression involving the application of a recent Supreme Court decision in the context of earlier pronouncements, et cetera, et cetera, more case citation that bears on this particular decision. On the other hand, the court says, a serious legal question is absent when, for example, there is a dearth of authority supporting the movement's position and binding precedent undercuts it. So, yeah, Maybe you don't really have a serious legal question. I mean, it sounds like it. But the court here assumes that the RNC's First Amendment claim presents a serious legal question. We'll give that to you. In several respects, this claim represents an issue of first impression involving the applicant of Americans for Prosperity Foundation v. Bonta, right? That's another case citation. And they cite many others as well as other cases here. 
And further, the claim is a complicated one, having taken up a large portion of the court's merits analysis and requiring extensive unpacking of the legal framework, as well as application of that framework to the facts. The court thus assumes the claim presents a fair ground for litigation and warrants more deliberate investigation, as we previously said. The question then is whether the other three factors tip sharply in the RNC's favor. And do they? No, motherfucker, they do not. Uh, (laughs) I'm paraphrasing. Let me read what the court actually says. But, and here's what they say. They don't say, no, motherfucker. They say this. The RNC argues that absent an injunction pending appeal, it will suffer irreparable harm in that this case will become moot before the circuit can decide on the merits. The court agrees. However, the House argues any delay would further interfere with the select committee's investigation, which is at a critical juncture as it approaches public hearings and is attempting to promptly complete its investigative efforts. Thus, with weighty considerations on both sides of the scale, the court cannot say the merged balance of equities and public interest factors tip sharply, quote unquote, in the RNC's favor. Sorry, you lose. For all these reasons, the court will deny the RNC's motion insofar as it requests an injunction pending appeal, but grants its motion insofar as it seeks a tiny injunction to allow the RNC to appeal to the circuit court. Fun. All right. Thank you for that, AG. Thank you. And closing out the segment, we are going to Larry Ellison, the billionaire co-founder and chairman of the software company Oracle and the biggest backer of who Elon Musk's attempt Twitter takeover participated. Yes, they participated in a call shortly after the 2020 election that focused on strategies for contesting the legitimacy of the vote. And that's according to court documents and a participant in that call. Now, the November 14th call included who? Lindsey Graham, Fox News host Sean Hannity, Jay Sekulow, and an attorney for... Come on down. You're the next contestant on Overturn the Election. Exactly. And an attorney for President Donald Trump and James Bopp Jr. All these guys and their last names, I don't know why they make me so happy. Now, Bopp Jr., an attorney for True the Vote, is a Texas-based nonprofit that has promoted disputed claims of widespread voter fraud. Now, Ellison's participation illustrates previously unknown dimension in the multifaceted campaign to challenge Trump's loss, an effort still coming into focus more than 18 months later. It is the first known example of a technology industry titan joining powerful figures in conservative politics. So before that, it was just pillow titans. That's right. Now this is technology industry jumping mm-hmm. in. Also in, included in that of the first is media and law to strategize about Trump's post-loss options and confer with an activist group that had already filed four lawsuits seeking to uncover evidence of illegal voting. That, I think that activist group is actually... America First Pack, which is Sidney Powell's yep. joint, which is under federal investigation. Yeah, all that shit sketchy as fuck. Now, Ellison, Ellison is the 11th richest person in the world with a net hmm. worth of about $85 billion with a fucking B, according to Bloomberg Billionaires Index. He became a major political power broker during the Trump administration, hosting the president in 2020 for a fundraiser at his estate in California's Coachella Valley and contributing millions to Republican candidates and committees, including Graham, according to filings with the Federal Elections Commission. Now, during the Trump administration Mm -hmm. in 2020, Oracle partnered with the Department of Health and Human Services to collect data from doctors treating coronavirus infections with hydroxychloroquine, the anti-malaria drug touted by the president, among other drugs. Now, that fall, it won praise from Donald as a great company as it became the preferred U.S. buyer of TikTok in a potential deal with Chinese company ByteDance that did not ever come to fruition. I think we remember that because Trump was pissed about TikTok because they kept fucking up his, <laughs> his uh, rallies. <laughs> now, details of the November 2020 call and questions about Ellison's role in it, they were revealed in new filings made in litigation brought against True the Vote and its representatives by Fair Fight, which is a political action committee associated with the voting rights organization founded by Georgia Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey fucking Abrams. Yup. And here's a quote. Jim was on a call this evening with Jay Succulo, Lindsey Graham, Sean Hannity, and Larry Ellison. This is True the Vote's founder, Catherine Engelbrecht. She wrote, wrote to a donor on the night of the call referring to BOP, her organization's lawyer. 
and went on and said, he explained the work we were doing and they asked for a preliminary report as soon as possible to be used to rally their troops internally. So that's what I'm working on now. Okay. Now, Bob, by the way, was Marjorie Taylor Greene's lawyer. Yep. In her case about not qualifying to run for Congress under the 14th Amendment. And he was the dude that brought and won Citizens United. So he's a fucker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, Ellison's participation in the call was confirmed by a participant and who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private matters, of course. And this person said Ellison, as a technology executive, may have been enlisted to assess claims about voting machines made by Sidney Powell, as we know, as a one-time member of Trump's legal team. Really, really bad, shitty legal team. And the person <laughs> said the GOP mega donor was probably looped in by Lindsey Graham as part of a discussion about whether Donald's campaign had assembled an effective legal team. They had because not. He gave he gave so much money to Lindsey Graham. Yes. Ellison did. And so Graham's like, well, we should listen to this guy. And of yeah, course, because wow. he's bought and paid for. Now, when asked why yep. this explains it, why the senator would have sought the technology magnates participation. Graham spokesman Kevin Bishop said probably because Ellison supported Trump. But did not respond to follow-up questions about Ellison. <laughs> yep, about Ellison's input, and would not say directly whether Graham had invited Ellison. That's funny. It's like one person. We hey, we found another person who believes this bullshit. So we might as well bring him there in. There you go. A secular said his involvement in election-related litigation was limited, largely ending after he helped file a motion with the Supreme Court seeking to separate out mail-in ballots that arrived in Pennsylvania after election day from those that had come before. Now, Justice Alito granted the motion on November 6th. Mind you, Thomas is hearing these fucking cases while his wife is trying to overturn the election. I'm so annoyed. I know. I know right? All right. Now, True the Vote has raised its profile significantly in recent weeks by collaborating with conservative commentator Dinesh D'Souza. Is that how you say Dinesh? I don't know. Okay, care. good. I didn't think so. <laughs> on a film that I, normally she corrects me, but we don't care about this human being. They're not a good person Mm -hmm. on a film that alleges there was widespread ballot harvesting in 2020 election. Now, the film called 2000 Mules was shown at (laughs) this. This is where it premiered Trump's Mar-a-Lago Club last month and has become a focal point of ongoing efforts to deny the legitimacy of the election. Now, that's a hell of a premiere. I know. Right. Several such claims were dismissed this week by Georgia state elections boards. Yeah, like nice movie. None of it happened. Have a nice day. 2000 mules by the way when madison cawthorn tweeted that out it got some of the best responses. oh my god i'm sure it's it 2000 mules i i said please don't show us video of you with nope. 2000 mules and my friend my friend michael castleberry said in a row i saw that that was hysterical <laughs> i thought that was good all right everybody we will be right back with dr tung nguyen of the aapi victory alliance you don't want to miss this conversation stay with us after these messages we'll be right back hey everyone This year, I've been focusing on taking better care of myself, and that's why I kick off every day with Athletic Greens AG1. It does so much for me, which is one delicious scoop of AG1. You're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day off right. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. All the things in one delicious scoop of AG1. Athletic Greens contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, while still tasting great. I take my scoop first thing in the morning when I'm doing my stretches. Helps me set my path right for the rest of the day. I'm so happy I made Athletic Greens part of my daily routine. It's very easy to bring into your routine. It's so, so simple and convenient. It replaces tons of pills and supplements and superfoods and all that stuff and probiotics, right? I don't have to take that anymore. It's all in AG1 and it's climate neutral certified. Uh, I love this athletic greens, climate neutral certified company. And in 2020 athletic greens purchased carbon credits that support projects protecting old growth rainforests because athletic greens cares about your health and the health of the planet. I love that so much. And the daily beans wants to thank athletic greens for their support. And they're offering you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase when you go to athleticgreens.com slash daily beans. It's time to reclaim your health, arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you that free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. 
Again, all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash daily beans. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash daily beans to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm happy to be joined today by the chair of AAPI Victory Alliance, the Stephen J. McPhee, MD, Endowed Chair in General Internal Medicine and Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Tung Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen, welcome. Thank you, Allison, for having me on. I'm really excited to talk to you today because I have an administrative healthcare background and your credentials in the medicine, internal medicine, and talking and aiming our discussion at mitigating gun violence in the United States. And I, first of all, wanted to ask you about what your positions in internal medicine and AAPI Victory Alliance do in furtherance of mitigating gun violence. Yeah. Let me just start by describing my organization just to, so people have a sense as to why we do what we do. The first thing is that with Victory Alliance, it's actually a 501c4 nonprofit organization created by a bunch of commissioners from President Obama's White House Commission on AAPI back in 2017 when we resigned en masse from the Trump administration. And the whole point about that is that we want to activate and empower Asian American Pacific Islander voters to carry out progressive policies and support progressive candidates. In my other hat, my regular day job, I'm a professor of medicine who, who does a lot of public health research and health disparities research at the University of California, San Francisco. And so the, the intersection of those two things uh, is important for gun violence and gun control issues, right? So as a public health researcher, we treat all deaths the same in the sense that if there's a lot of people dying from something, it's a public health problem. There's a lot of people in this country dying from gun violence. And I think pretty much everyone in health now sees it as a public health problem. But it also goes beyond a public health problem. It also becomes a personal health problem. There's a lot of data that suggests that there's intimate partner violence, for example. The gun uh, presence uh, makes things worse. So even in taking care of an individual patient, we ask questions about, do you have a gun in the house? Because that's actually a risk factor the same way as if you don't wear a seatbelt. Uh, or you smoke cigarettes. <laughs> That's how we treat it. We don't we don't take a political adva- uh, from a, a health and public health perspective. We're not looking at it from a pl- political point of view. We're looking at from what matters to the health of the community. From the Victory Alliance's point of view, though, you know, Asian Americans are also exposed to sort of more systemic issues uh, such as hate and racism, and of course, uh, guns uh, have a huge role to play in. Uh, making those sort of uh, anti-Asian activities uh, worse, right? Because uh, it magnifies whatever kind of violence that happens. Yeah, especially uh, in light of the huge spikes in violence against the AAPI community in recent years uh, with, you know, the, the Trump administration blaming coronavirus on uh-huh. Asians. And, and I imagine that uh, gun violence plays a, a heavy role in that. And And I had just read a statistic that we just surpassed gun death having more impact on children than car accidents now. More death is caused by gun violence for children than than car accidents. And so it it is definitely a public health problem and, and frankly, a public health emergency. When did we get the ability, because I know it had been blocked for decades, the ability to study gun violence as a public health issue or just to study it at all? Wasn't there recently yeah. some movement on that? Yeah. So, you know, for years, um, the federal government prevented the NIH from studying gun violence, I think, for political reason, I think. Um, that doesn't mean that there wasn't research going on. I mean, there were people who are you know, funding research projects, but certainly the amount of projects that we can do are, are, are less. Uh, but there's more support for it now. Uh, I did want to say, you know, that the importance of research, there's a recent paper that came out that I thought was incredibly amazing. It came out of the Annals of Internal Medicine just maybe a couple months ago or a month ago. And and basically what they did, this really cool project that actually I felt like linked both political advocacy with gun control, and that is they took the voters' rolls of 17 million Californians, uh, and they followed them for 12 years, from 2004 to 2016. And all they did was they said, well, who had a gun in the house? And of course, people could have been, in the beginning, not have a gun, but then eventually they acquire a gun during those 12 years. And what they found was those who actually own a handgun uh, in this 17 million population, two, were two times more likely to die from homicide and three times more likely to die from gun homicide. So gun ownership is actually bad for the person who owns the gun, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, I, I think it's an important point to make. And then second of all, if people who live in the same house as the person who owns the gun, 
they were seven times more likely to be shot and killed by someone in the house. And 84% of those people who were shot and killed by someone in the house were women. Mm -hmm. So the point that this this particular piece of research is really great because uh, it, it allows us to make the argument that owning a gun is just not safe, not for the person who owns it and not for the family members of those who own it. And at the end of the day, when you're making a health argument to someone about something, those are the two arguments that actually are, are really persuasive. <laughs> now, is the goal to get people to no longer own guns or is the goal to make them safer in some way so that, I mean, yeah. obviously we can't tell people not to own guns, like a handgun in the house. That's we're, that's not going to be an, an option <laughs> at any point. But is it more of an education piece? Yeah, it's a classic public health thing. And I actually don't approach public health as yes or no answers. <laughs> Public health is all about um, figuring out where people are and getting them to go to the step that's the next step that's safest for them. And so some of that does involve, you know, regulations and laws, but some of it also involves, you know, education and and and, and what we call harm mitigation. Right now, the answer, of, you know, which one of these approach works for guns, we don't know because we obviously don't have studies about this mm-hmm. uh, because we don't have research you know, enough time to have done the research or enough research support. But, you know, the way that we normally approach this, is if you really have to own a gun, then you probably should learn how to take good care of it and make sure that there are mitigation, harm mitigation issues, right? So whether it's a gun lock, you know, or, you know, whatever, keeping it out of the reach of others. But, it, you know, to me, it actually gets more complicated than that because, you know, if mental health, you know, there's an association of guns with uh, suicide and homicide, right, uh, and with, with uh, people with mental health issues, then you also have to take care of your mental health. If you really are trying to, you know, minimize the damage that you your ownership of a gun, then you only have to lock it up, make sure no one gets access to it. But you also have to think about like how do you handle stress? <laughs> you know, how do you, you know, and, you know, and you, I mean, you can lock up a gun, but if you're stressed out and you unlock the gun and take it out, then that's not, that 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 mitigation didn't work, right? It's just one additional thing that we have to do. Yeah. And, and I worked for over a decade a lot with veterans. And of course, there's a higher suicide rate and a higher handgun owning rate in that particular group of folks. But I, I imagine it's it's much like an automobile where, you know, we're not going to take your car away from you, but we're going to have seat belts, insurance, safety glass, advanced braking systems, registration, things like that. Those those harm mitigators. Yeah. And I think that's what gun control uh, legislation is all about. I don't think anyone's trying to ban guns. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're just trying to make uh, uh, gun ownership uh, safer by ensuring that not the people who aren't aren't going to be very safe probably shouldn't get a hand on gun. I mean, there are some reasons why we have, you know, background checks so that people shouldn't own gun who clearly have, you know, intent to hurt other people. But also those who own guns learn how to Take care of them safely. And I don't, you know, what the thing that I don't get is why people have an objection to that, because what we're trying to do is, you know, make sure responsible gun ownership is uh, healthy for the person who owns the gun and the family members that are living with them. So, yeah. And, and can you tell us just uh, briefly some of the concrete, practical steps that you're taking in your organization, particularly? I mean, you, this is, you know, the API, et cetera. How is it different? How does it look different or does it look the same than than some of the practical concrete steps other communities might be taking? Well, first of all, you know, um, you know, we're, we're crossing two issues that are both under study. <laughs> One is guns and the other is APIs. We're, we're, we're just the most important thing that the general listener should know about API population is that there's a lot of misconception about us, partly because of prejudice, but also partly because data collection is inadequate. The data that's being collected on us is either not done in the proper languages because many Asian Americans don't speak English well enough. They are a very heterogeneous population. So, you know, there are, you know, this category of AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander, cover over 30 countries of origins and over 100 languages spoken. So any data about Asian American Pacific Islander is always kind of tricky if you don't collect it properly or in what we call disaggregated fashion. Having said that, though, when we do ask people about guns, API data had a, a recent survey where they show that's over 70 percent or nearly 70 percent of Asian of APIs support stricter gun control, mm. number one. And when you break them down by certain groups like Chinese, Vietnamese, et cetera, that was pretty consistent across the board. There, there was some variation, but, but you know, around 65 to 75 percent of each of those groups uh, supported a stricter gun control law. 
The second thing that people, particularly in, in the general population, may not know about is that gun violence actually affected Asian Americans in particular a lot. Actually, most people don't know, but I remember because I was old enough and I live in the area that one of the first mass school shootings in America was in Stockton, California uh, in 1989. And the people who were killed then were young elementary school kids, most of whom were Southeast Asians. And so that was the beginning of a trend that does terrible, terrible trend. Uh, and then, of course, you know, most people remember the last couple of years, the shooting in Atlanta, the Atlanta spa shooting uh, with uh, most of the victims being Asian American women, the Sikh murders in Indianapolis. And then in 2012, there was an Oak Creek, uh, Wisconsin, Gawara shooting of, of people there who are Asian Americans. So for us, we're very sensitive to it. And the most important thing that we need to do for our population is making sure people know, number one, that this is very much related to another issue that they care about, which is anti-Asian hate, number mm -hmm. one. And number two, that there are ways that you can do, like as we talked about, to mitigate the harm of guns if they do decide to own one. And then number three, that we have the power to work on gun control legislation. Mm. And what are you finding? The number one complaint uh, from anyone I speak to, AAPI community, is the, is the lack of, of data, right? But what are you finding in the youth? Because I know that there has been an increase in the suicide rate for young AAPI members of the community. And so what are, are what sort of are you seeing in the difference in the data of different age groups? Because I know you just had just broken it down between different, you know, countries of origin, but yeah. what's going on with the difference in in the age demographic? Yeah, I don't have a lot of data in terms of how young APIs are thinking about guns and gun violence, although they tend to be more progressive than their elders. <laughs> so if if the general population is saying that they are pro gun control, then I would expect that young APIs are also pro gun control. There is, you know, the the suicide death among young Asian American behind the youth are going up and the rate of suicide by gun is going up. So it's an emerging issue, uh, important issue for us to address. You know, the way that we approach API population, it, it, we focus a lot on, on sort of multi-generational and family stuff. So so it's both ways. It's like you can, edu you can educate the young to help the older and the older to help the younger. And sometimes, you know, as a doctor, I'm actually, I'm quite acutely aware of this in, in this population is sometimes people don't worry about themselves so much as their loved ones. <laughs> And so, so instead of teaching them to take care of themselves, you teach them to take care of their loved ones. And actually, gun control is one of those situations where it works really well because you can ask the parents to take better care of guns so that the kids don't get hurt. And maybe the kids can teach the parents more about the guns uh, so that they don't get hurt. Um, and so uh, it, it's a good way to approach that. But, you know, and also, you know, I think we should be also be clear that the pandemic has also made things a lot worse mental health-wise for everybody but particularly for those age 18 to 24, the depression and anxiety rate among that population, it, among most racial populations, including APIs, is over 40 to 50 percent. And so you should expect this to get worse. And of course, as a clinician, you know, a gun makes someone who's suicidal much more likely to die from it mm -hmm. uh, because of the rapidity. You know, people, people can change their mind doing a lot of different things and, and gestures uh, for suicide, obviously, is it is easier to survive, relatively easier to survive than if you're doing with a gun. So, so you know, there are these, again, these harm mitigation things that we need to be talking about. So. Yeah, it definitely adds opportunity. Before we get out of here, can you tell listeners where they can learn more about AAPI Victory Alliance and support the organization? Because I think education awareness and, and support is, is probably the, the best place to start. Yeah, so the, the easiest way to find out more about us is AAPIVictoryAlliance.com. Pretty straightforward website. You know, gun control is only one of the things that we care about. And and I actually, you know, I might actually, as a doctor, I'm a generalist. I'm a primary care doctor. I focus on particular things like gun control, but I also understand that the similar things drive many things, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, whether it's gun control, voters' rights, or, you know, some other things, uh, it's all about organizing and activating and addressing underlying structural causes, and so uh, those who are interested in gun control among APIs definitely can check us out. And those who are interested in Asian American empowerment should check us out because I think we're one of the more unique organizations nationally working on these issues in a way that other organizations aren't. Uh, we do not limit ourselves. A lot of nonprofit obviously are limited from engaging in political advocacy too much. <laughs> we, are, we don't limit ourselves that way. We, we, we identify the issue 
we identify the appropriate solutions and we follow them and we don't limit ourselves by what the government says we can or can't do. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your insight and your time today. Thank you very much, Dr. Tung Nguyen. Uh, We look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Thank you for having me on. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey, everyone. An exciting part of my life is how much my sleep has improved since I got my Helix sleep mattress. I love sleeping. It's one of my favorite things. I used to toss and turn all night. I couldn't get good sleep. Uh, But then I discovered Helix. Helix Sleep has a two-minute online sleep quiz you can take that matches you with the perfect mattress for your sleep preferences and body type. Why would you sleep on a mattress made for someone else when Helix is here to give you the perfect mattress made just for you? I was matched with the Helix Midnight because I'm a side sleeper and I prefer a medium firm mattress. It has improved my life immeasurably. Now sleep is much easier. My mornings are free from aches and pains. I love it. People are unique and they have several different mattresses at Helix Sleep that you can choose from. They have soft, medium and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. And even mattress is great for spinal alignment to prevent those morning aches and pains. People have spent over a billion hours sleeping on Helix mattresses, and they have over 12,000 five-star reviews online. And Helix was awarded number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. So if you're looking for a mattress, go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans, take their two-minute sleep quiz, then order the mattress that you're matched to. The mattress will come right to your door and shipped for free, super fast. You don't even need to go to the mattress store. It's amazing. I love it. They have a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights. No risk. If you hate it, they'll come and pick it up, but you will love it, I promise. And they have financing options available at Helix and flexible payment plans. So they'll they'll work with you to get that good night's sleep. And Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners at helixsleep.com slash daily beans. That's H-E-L-I-X sleep.com slash daily beans for up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. And, you know, I talk a lot about my Helix mattress because I love sleeping and how comfortable and amazing it is. But now Helix has gone to the rest of the home and is making amazing couches and armchairs and love seats. They have a new company called All Form and a premium, premium customizable sofas just for you. Again, your preferences. They love you. They set up the easiest way to customize your sofa using premium materials at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. They've got armchairs, love seats, all the way up to eight seat sectionals. So there's something for everyone. All form sofas are delivered directly to your front door with fast free shipping. In the past, if you wanted to order a custom sofa, it would take like 12 weeks, 16 weeks, four months, right? But this all form comes in three to seven days in the mail, and you can assemble it in a few minutes by yourself. No tools needed. It's amazing. I ordered myself a three seater sofa in whiskey colored leather. It's got walnut legs and a chaise lounge. I am so impressed with how well it goes in my living room already, but I'm thinking of adding another seat because, you know, I'm going to start having people over now that the pool's going in. But uh, that's what's cool about all form. You can do that. You can add a seat if you want. You have that choice. And if getting a sofa without trying it in the store first sounds risky, don't worry. You get 100 days to decide if you want to keep this. That's more than three months. And if you don't love it, they'll come and pick it up for free and give you a full refund. That's it. No restocking fee, no weirdness. Um, And they also have a forever warranty, literally forever. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash daily beans. Allform is offering 20% off all orders for listeners at allform.com slash daily beans. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the good news segment. Uh, We have a lot of awesome submissions today. If you have anything you want to send in, whether it's a correction or a confession or good news or pod pet pics, whoopee stories, what you're creating, anything, you can send it into us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Now, remember the quote, great Apple debacle of April? Yes. Where Apple listeners stopped getting updated episodes? We figured out the issue. Thank you to Anna and Jelly at Apple for helping us with this. Long story short, there were two versions of the Daily Beans on Apple Podcasts. One of those feeds will disappear soon. So if you follow the beans on Apple, this doesn't apply to patrons. Don't worry, patrons or Supercast subscribers. You ignore me. Plug your ears. La la Mm -hmm. la. But if you follow Daily Beans on Apple, make sure you're following the right one. The one linked in today's show notes. You could do that by going to apple.co slash beans, all lowercase, by the way, it is case sensitive, apple.co slash beans. 
And that will take you to the version that will stick around. The other one we have to archive and I don't want you to lose it. So that's what's happening with that. First up, Dana from Anonymous Pronouns, she and her. Hi, small correction on Thursday's episode. Allison suggested that cases are decided by a judge on summary judgment when they are egregious. Did I say that? I don't remember. I didn't say that. Actually, a case is decided on summary judgment when there are only questions of law and no questions of fact. We don't have to deal with the merits. I, I, I knew that, huh? If I said that, I'm super sorry. I didn't, I don't actually think that. So it would be weird for me to say that. Only juries, uh, judges in the case of a bench trial, can decide on questions of fact. Judges rule on questions of law. So this Tennessee transgender bathroom sign case is indeed egregious and disgusting and totally vile. But that's just not why the judge was able to decide it on summary judgment. Love the show. Thank you. Thank you. There you have. All right. This is from Sherry. Pronouns she and her. Good news. I finally got off my hiney and applied for school to get my doctorate in audiology. Nice. (gasps) And I've been practicing for 22 years and kept putting it off. My baby girl, Rachel, 19, passed of Rett syndrome and COVID in October. And I knew I needed something to occupy my brain. Indeed, Sherry. I'm so sorry. Hopefully my next good news will be that I was accepted. I hope so as well, Sherry. Now, pet tax is my two pitties who uh, rescued us in August, mom Sadie and daughter Zoe, or Zoe probably, and our kitty Jordan who walked in our house one day and never left. Oh, and just for (laughs) extra credit, my 22-year-old son's Whoopi, white lion, and I discovered he still had it on his bed when helping him move recently. White lion. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at these babies. All of these pictures are so sweet. Oh, look at that kitty. What a beautiful cat. That's an interesting color. A white lion. There it is. That's so funny. Gosh, thank you for that. Congratulations. We hope you get accepted. Let us know. Let us know. Next up from anonymous pronouns, she and her. First, the bad news. Then I promise good news. The bad news I tested positive with COVID last Wednesday morning. I'm fully vaccinated and boosted but was not careful about wearing a mask on the van ride to the Cardinal game last Friday. I hardly have any symptoms, congestion and a cough with a headache. But now at the end of my five days of quarantine, I find myself very lucky. I'm a nurse who has worked with COVID patients. And now I work with the elderly. Hope I didn't get anyone sick at work. The good news is I have a job I love. I can take my dog Diesel to work with me. I love that name. He is taken care of by one of the sisters. I work at a retirement assisted living house for sisters of Karen DeLay. Hmm. She loves Diesel as much as if not more than I do. Even the administrator comes and loves on Diesel when she has a bad day. Aw, I love my job. I'm happy to share my dog with the residents. Here are pictures of Diesel and Mary Jane, MJ for short. They are my life. I listen to you beans queens as I walk my pups in the morning. This little chorky is Diesel. And the black and white one is MJ. You queens keep rocking the good news the way you do. Love being a patron. Namaste. Nice. Look at <gasps> oh, oh, these babies. Oh my are god, sweet. look at this chihuahua. <laughs> oh, look at the face. The little smile. It's so cute. All right, everyone. This is a correction that I deserve. I'm just gonna start with that. This is from Mike from Ohio, and then I'm probably gonna have a comment afterwards. However, I will read it and I'll take it. I love you ladies, but I do offer a correction for an off the cuff comment. Yes, it was off the cuff that Dana made. She said that the men, quote, don't often qualify for the World Cup. I did misspeak there, sir. And I'll explain that later. Now, the U.S. men's national team has qualified for every World Cup since 1990, including 2022. Yes, very excited about that. But with the exception of 2018, that's seven of eight Missing the World Cup was the lowest point in the recent history of the U.S. men's national team because it's expected that we qualify and then that we advance to the knockout stage. Few countries have a better men's qualification record than the U.S., but almost all of such countries have won the World Cup. The World Cup only happens every four years. With the one miss and the World Cup not happening this year until November, it means the last time the men qualified was 2014. The women have won the whole thing twice. That's Bullshit, by the way, sir. But I will comment later. The women have oh my yep, gosh. the woman the women have won the whole thing twice, 2015 and 19, since the last time we saw the men in the World Cup. So it may seem rare that the men qualify, but it is a trick of perception. Okay. 
Have the women not won twice since 2014? It, no, they've won. They've won World Cup four times, 2015, 2019. And I'll need to look at the other dates, but they have four stars. You get a star every time you win the World Cup. I understand what he is saying. Right. He's saying since the men have qualified Correct. since 2014, they've won. Twice. Yes, you are rock stars of the news. If you were uh, an, a rock band, you would be heart. That was very sweet, oh, Mike. Nice. Yes. Now, attaches my chonk named Mary, who got an injury to his tail and vet had to shave it to put in stitches. His tail looks so silly now. Oh, his tail oh my God, look very look silly. <laughs> All right, Mike. I want to do this to my cat. Can I do it just for no, fun? You may not. Okay. Mike, I honor the correction. However, comma, I need to tell you that after so many years of the women being underpaid, underrespected, and undertaken care of, in comparison to the men, I've built up some animosity. And when I'm animus, sometimes I exaggerate or lie, depending on how angry or how angry I am. <laughs> but the truth is, I think the story for me, and I probably did off the cuff say that, I know I did, is just frustration that the men, and we can agree on this one, Mike, the furthest they have gotten in the World Cup is third place. Yes? All right. We're in agreement with that. The women have won four times. The women make less for winning the entire World Cup than the men do for qualifying. That's what my frustration was. I understand why you took away this correction. I wish I would have kept to the facts because that was the point of the whole thing. And now it has been fixed. And the next World Cup, the men and the women will make the same amount based on how far they get in the tournament. Awesome. Thank you for and that I Thank you for the Mike. correction, Mike. It's accepted. <laughs> it's accept. You're accepted, Mike. Congratulations. Next up from Jen, pronouns she and her. New game. On Friday's Daily Beans, AG casually mentioned that between her career in the Navy and her career in the VA, she was in hotel and restaurant management, prompting me to ask, is there any job AG has not done? Stand-up comedian, Navy nuke school, podcast magnate, published in the Washington Post. Have you ever been, say, a petroleum transference engineer? No. If you don't know that gig, I gently remind you that New Jersey still has a 100% full-service gas station pump. I, that's true. When you go to New Jersey, 100% full-service. Every time someone writes in about their job, I'm, I'm going to wonder if you've already done it. Feels to me like there's nothing AG can't do or hasn't already done. As a pod pet tax, please enjoy Hagrid, quote-unquote, helping me fold the laundry. Ah, yes, my cats love helping me fold the laundry too, Jen. And one of our previous Maine Coon cats, Tazzy, who crossed the Rainbow Bridge four years ago. Here he is being a super good sport about our then four-year-old showing off his size for the camera. Oh my God, look oh at this. Oh my goodness, indeed. <laughs> Holy shit, balls, that. that's a big cat. That's a Maine Coon cat. Look at, he's almost as tall as the child. Well, arms up, he would be. That is nuts. Oh my God. Amazing. What a beautiful kitty. Indeed. Oh, thank you for sending that in. And yeah, I was in hotel restaurant management in my forthcoming book, which I might be out like next year. I'll tell you how I accidentally became a madam. Oh, <laughs> so we're going to get all sorts of interesting stories. <laughs> I mean, who would have Thank thought you. that was coming? <laughs> right. Um, it was an accident. So whatever. But thank you all for sending in your good news stories. If you have anything you want to send in, good news, confessions, corrections, animal pictures, you can send them in to us by going to dailybeanspod.com and clicking on contact. I'm going to go have some lemon tea Please do. with honey. And uh, I'm so sorry, everyone, about my voice. I, I, hopefully it will be better tomorrow. I want you to feel better, honey. Do you have any um, final thoughts? My final thoughts are to thank the producers behind this podcast. That made us sound very, very good today. There was a lot of work on their part. So I just want to give a special shout out to the people <laughs> behind the scenes today that kept Allison and I <laughs> looking as professional as possible. Thank you and amen. Y'all don't know it, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 edits today. That's a record. So yeah. yes, thank you to our and producers. And sometimes we don't have any. Sometimes we have one or two, but today, 15. Today was special. Yep. Yeah, it's a special day. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will be back tomorrow. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. And vote blue over Q. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. 
For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.